it is our duty to figure out what Web3 means for uh, luxury uh, and fashion. And we build our strategy based off of this notion that we're doing this not for Farfetch, we're doing it beyond Farfetch uh, for the industry. Okay, so today I'm really happy to welcome on our next guest, Martin Avetishan, who is Chief Growth Officer at Farfetch. Welcome, Martin. Hi, Jamie. Uh, great to be here and thank, thanks for the invite. So we've got Martin on for a couple of reasons. You know, firstly, he's a serial founder and we'll let him talk about that a little bit later. Um, he is also uh, a partner over at Farfetch um, with Outlier and we've recently announced a collaboration around a dream assembly base camp uh, with our Web3 Accelerator focused on fashion and, and a wider luxury category, which is really exciting. So we'll get into that a little bit. But also, you know, Martin has a really interesting insight into how enterprise is looking at Web3 and the open metaverse. You know, I can certainly personally attest to Farfetch as an organization being one of the most forward thinking, but also acting organizations in the space pretty consistently from conversations I've had with the CEO and founder, Jose, uh, to Martin, and all across the organization. So I want to understand that kind of institutional journey into Web3, um, and then also uh, Martin and, and Farfetch's thesis for, for the space. But Martin, maybe before we get into all of that, we just let the audience get to know you a little bit better. As I said, you're a serial founder, actually almost a freakish like success rate as a founder, three back-to-back -back exits, one of them being Farfetch. Tell us a little bit about you and, and your, your founder journey so they know who they're talking to. Great, thanks. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I was, um, was a hedge fund manager in my previous life. Uh, and in, in 2008, when the financial crisis hit, you know, I, I thought this is the time to change uh, a career. And, and back then, um, you know, tech was starting evolving. And, and this is when I decided that, you know, um, crisis is the best time to start building a financial crisis. And so I moved into entrepreneurship. Um, my first two startups were in loyalty and rewards um, space, game, um, build, and did the exit uh, pretty early stage. Uh, uh, back then, retrospectively looking back, it was probably too early, too premature, but at the time it felt the right thing uh, to do and something that I can do again. So. I exited my first startup to uh, um, a payment network, um, the second one to a bank, and then probably the third one is the most interesting one, which uh, I um, eventually, uh, less than two year old from the um, inception, uh, sold to Farfetch, and that was back in 2014. I met, uh, we were at a uh, quite exciting journey with a similar marketplace. Um, to Farfetch, raised uh, funds and was on a journey, no plans to exit. Um, and, and, and then one day I, I completely accidentally met uh, Jose, the founder of Farfetch. Uh, we clicked, uh, it was astonishing how aligned the vision is and, and um, I decided to uh, join forces uh, with Jose to help him um, build Farfetch. It was 2014, it's year nine, and um, it, it's probably a good segue. And when, when we were having that deal, Josette did made the promise that the organization is going to uh, you know, celebrate entrepreneurship and uh, it will be a journey like entrepreneur in residence. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is I think um, it's, it's, it's getting to your question or how is, how come a far-fetched uh, a public company, a corporation, uh, if you may, has um, such a different and agile uh, view towards metaverse. And the reason is that, and the reason is that 
you know, we're still founder-led company, even though we're a corporation, you know, entrepreneurship is something very, very important. It's at the level of worship at uh, Farfetch and experimenting with new things, trying, failing, moving fast, learning is, is still pretty much um, there. And the opportunities, the immense opportunities for innovation that Web3 opens up is, is, is just something that we, uh, we couldn't ignore. So maybe just give some context to Farfetch because I think people have different levels of understanding generally based upon their understanding of the luxury industry as a whole. You know, some people may be familiar with Farfetch through farfetch.com only. Um, others will have a deeper understanding. You know, certainly I, I didn't understand the scale at which you guys are effectively the, the backbone for the whole luxury industry, almost the whole luxury industry now. Um, so maybe you could just talk about Farfetch from that perspective. So I think people get get an understanding of the kind of scale that you guys operate at. And, and then I think that then carries forward into the potential of an enterprise like uh, Farfetch joining Web3 seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very good point because we are most known for our uh, marketplace, our direct to consumer business that farfetch.com or, or, or mobile app. Um, but in reality, behind that uh, really beautiful, attractive picture, there is a very sophisticated uh, machine working um, there. We are, in that sense, we are, we are a tech company more than a fashion company in the sense that, you know, we are building, our vision is to uh, be the platform, the tech platform and tech enabler uh, for the entire luxury industry. And so uh, in, 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 in probably the simplified uh, words, you know, we, the, the, the Farfetch machine is uh, behind that uh, interface, is integrated into around 3,000 independent stock points in 60 countries that runs a um, automated single view of uh, inventory and single view of uh, a, um, a customer. Um, so if, if, if you come to Farfetch and, and buy this t-shirt, click buy, you know, that order goes to the algorithm, identify the closest boutique at the best price located to you, sends an, uh, a message to that specific uh, boutique or, or retail or brand partner. And all they need to do is to take it from the shelf, put it in Farfetch box, and then uh, Farfetch will ship it to 190 countries uh, next um, day. And similarly, if somebody walks into that store and, and buys this T-shirt, it will automatically disappear from uh, Farfetch. As you would imagine, it's quite a uh, sophisticated uh, engine. Um, and, 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 and this is how we enable this one dimension, how we enable uh, the industry through our tech solutions. We also have uh, enterprise solution where we provide white label solution, 360 uh, digital tech solutions for brands to, and retailers to run their own uh, tech operations. And within our structure, we also have uh, what we call brand platform. Our brand platform is um, if you may, an incubator of, uh, of, of luxury brands. In our portfolio, we have brands uh, like um, Off-White, Palm Angels, Perrin Preston, a, a, a roster of brands that we, uh, we currently um, operate. So it is quite, um, um, you know, um, multifaceted organization in terms of tech e enabling tech for the uh, luxury. And I think this is also a good segue towards what we mean for the industry in a sense that, you know, we have been the innovation partner for the brands. Historically, we were the ones to guide them through their journey into uh, digital, into online. Uh, you know, back in 2008, when Farfetch was founded, uh, selling luxury clothes online uh, was uh, lunacy or a wishful thinking that um, was completely um, impossible. Uh, fast forward 10 years, today having a sophisticated brand.com uh, for a brand or retailer is an absolute table stakes. It's, it's uh, um, you know, part of their strategy, part of their channels and distributions, and it's inseparable from everything else. So in a very similar nature, to when 
online was new or um, social media came in and brands were, should we be there or should we not? What, what do we do with this? I think in a very similar nature, we now have this Web3 phenomenon where brands are uh, luxury and fashion brands. Uh, you know, some are adopting, many are exploring and very curious, but it's evident that this is here to stay. And there is this question mark out there. What is it exactly that we should do there? And as their trusted tech and innovation partners, we almost felt it is our duty to figure out what Web3 means for uh, luxury uh, and fashion. And we build our strategy based off of this notion that we're doing this not for Farfetch, we're doing it beyond Farfetch uh, for the industry. Yeah, and I think what's been interesting, so you know, we're Q3 2022 now. Over the last 12 months, I would say fashion has been by far one of the quicker adopters of Web3, the most enthusiastic about NFTs. Um, and I thought even just yesterday, I think it was Gucci appointed a, a head of Metaverse and a, kind of a second in command vice president of Metaverse, obviously Gucci, a client of um, Farfetch's. So, you know, at an industry level, there's a huge amount of appetite some experimentation, some quite campaign-like, but increasingly, you know, some, some really serious moves being made. One of the things I really liked hearing you talk about the space and your, your approach to it, keeping in mind your chief growth officer at Farfetch, is thinking about the metaverse as a new territory. Um, and so maybe you can kind of talk us through that and, and, and just give context as to um, why thinking of it as a territory is kind of relevant to your role and how you've kind of rolled out in other territories, physical territories. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Um, um, I think that the, the, the journey started from us looking and, and, and again, it came through uh, a vast amount of adoptions from luxury and fashion brands. You know, you would wake up in the morning, open a business of fashion, and every day there is brand X did this in uh, Metaverse. So we figured out that, you know, we, we need to look into this space. From the very early days of the exploration, we, we figured out that there is no, it's, it's not actually a, a different dimension. We shouldn't look into it as a new uh, dimension as such because many say the real life and metaverse are going to converge uh, we think they're already converged uh, there is no you, you don't say like in back in the days when social media came in you wouldn't say well these are the uh it's different dimension who are the how do how do we speak to people there etc because these were the same people they were just having a social media profile it's now um, very similar to Metaverse where, um, you know, we have users, they are the same users, the adoption level is low, but these are the same people, the same users who are in the internet, who are in social, they're now in, 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 in Metaverse. But we looked into Web3 and, and, and the sort of the trends we spotted, very similar to uh, in real life, where we, we started looking into it as a community. Uh, like almost like a tribe uh, of Web3. Uh, uh, think of a tribe and, and it's a subculture. You know, they, they live in a, in, in a bigger culture that we have. The mass adoption is still not there. This is why they're a subculture. And they have their own, they have their own language. They have their own uh, heroes. They have their own currency. Crypto is the currency uh, of, of, of Web3. So, so in the, in, 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 in that sense, it was very similar. We, we found analogies to the new markets where we started entering new territories, geographies, the likes of China or Japan, where you know you, these people speak different language. Um, you know the payment methods are different. The, the, the customer behavior is different, and so if you want to different be, social norms as well, right? I, absolutely, I, I, everything. The taste levels are different. You know, e even going further as. Um, you know, the brand X, I don't know what the Gucci or Balenciaga, they would actually have collections for that part of the Japan collection would be different to what they sell in Japan store. So it's, it's, it's quite different in that sense. And we, in order to be successful, uh, you know, we always said that our 
vision for going into new territories is not going after the wallet, go after the hearts and minds. Win hearts and minds, and then uh, the rest uh, would follow. We always guide it that way. And looking into this tribe that is evolving, we genuinely uh, fell in love with that for all, all its principles of uh, open co collaboration, decentralization, uh, partnerships. Uh, th these are values that genuinely resonated um, with us. And we thought in order to be successful, we need our strategy, our vision should be to be a bridge between Web3 and Web2. I think it's quite probably a beaten word and terminology. Many are talking about bridging the gap now. Uh, but we genuinely thought that, you know, this needs to be a two-way uh, sort of effort and, 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 and activity in the sense that Web3 is, is a nascent place. Yes, there is a big level of enthusiasm around it, but it's very far from being as mass adopted as, uh, as Web2. And therefore, the space needs, um, you know, I probably won't be scared to use the word validation, uh, but in a sense, the bigger players from real world should come and find that practical implication of Web3, what Web3 has to offer, whether it's from the technology standpoint or, or, or creativity standpoint, what does it mean for them today? Um, and so, and, and, and vice versa. And, and, and then the Web2 communities should see in, in Web3 an opportunity. Uh, yes, it's uncharted territory, but here is where we think we can uh, you know, have a role of almost like an ambassadorship to demonstrate what are today's uh, the, the value that today this space provides, what are the potential opportunities um, in, in, in future. Um, and that's how we're building our ecosystem uh, as a two-way bridge to bring Web2 into Web3 and to guide Web3 into Web2 as, uh, in terms of mass, uh, mass adoption. Yeah, and there's a couple of interesting themes there as well. You know, so when I first had a touch point with the fashion industry in the context of Web3, um, it was with Dolce Gabbana, I think it was in 21. Um, and I went to the Venice um, fashion show that they put on and the after party. And um, of course, they had all these seated tables after the catwalk. And it was amazing just how much hip hop culture, celebrity, was fully integrated into that whole show, the private after party. I would say of the 25 tables there, maybe 19 were hip hop based. Um, P, P Diddy was there and, you know, various other people. And I think, you know, so fashion's always been great at engaging new cultures, new communities, integrating them into um, fashion. To be to to stay relevant, right? Um, I think also this point around validation, I think is really true because you know Web three likes to think Web three natives and DGens like to think somehow they're creating a parallel economic system, or a parallel culture, and it's somehow pure um, and it and it's it's kind of self referential. It doesn't necessarily need um, outsiders. But the reality is, you know, personally speaking, being in the space for, you know, just under nine years is always looking for validation, whether it's uh, JP Morgan and the financial industry that it's supposed to disrupt. And everyone's very excited when a bank, you know, creates a new, a new crypto product or says that it's, um, you know, taking exposure. Uh, I remember similarly with NFTs, a lot of the uh, early NFT artists said, you know, we're gonna remove the need for Sotheby's and Christie's. And then of course, you know, less than a year later, they're kind of clamoring to show their collections um, with what was relatively fast adoption. So maybe we kind of just go into the Farfetch thesis for, for Web3 and, and the open metaverse. It's kind of, I guess, foundational elements. Sure. Um um, look, you, you, are, you are very spot on in your observation that fashion is, is engraved into that 
uh, a culture making and community. It is fashion is a community driven uh, industry. Um, and so it's, it's not a coincidence that fashion and luxury are one of the closest in adoption uh, into metaverse. It has to do with those pillars of uh, being community driven, culture driven, culture creation and craftsmanship and, and creativity, which all, all of this uh, today exists in, in, in metaverse. Our thesis is in simplified terms, uh, you know, our vision is that every process, everything that happens in real life uh, in the industry is going to inevitably coexist uh, in, in metaverse across all, uh, all the touch points uh, to the industry. Again, this, this is not we, the way we look into it is single view towards uh, both uh, dimensions. I can I probably give one example on uh, or, 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 or few, for example, the um, the playbook of, of, of fashion um, as of today is, you know, that the new season would come, the designer uh, would create a new collection, and these new uh, collections would be demonstrated to the external world um, through what we call Fashion Weeks. The Fashion Week is a, is a great celebratory uh, type of event, but this is the place where we see the new creation. These new creations are, are, are uh, shown uh, on human models, on the runway. And this is how you show, this is my new collection. We have very good view over um, human model on the runway, uh, on the videos, up, behind, up. So you, you, you see uh, holistically, eloquently, you see what designer uh, had in mind in his creation. And, and, and fashion, you know, being a tool for self-expression self, uh, uh, and aesthetics, you know, that aesthetic uh, of seeing the, 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 the uh, creative, the outfits on a human model is right now has no analogs in, in metaverse. We, for example, we have seen many attempts of uh, doing fashion shows and uh, avatar digital, branded digital skins in a space, which we uh, completely celebrate th th those um, early attempts to do that. But, and, and we all understand that in order this to become a, a, a norm, a platform where you can use it, the aesthetics should be on par with human uh, models. Um, and so to that end, know that this playbook that exists in real life is going to coexist in metaverse. And so the areas where we uh, one of the areas that we explore and, and, and we think that is going to be successful is uh, a sophisticated avatar technology um, with a sophisticated layering mechanism that can give brands an opportunity to put their outfits on the avatar with the aesthetics and looks on par uh, with having it on a human model. Uh, the question around the interoperability, where would these avatars then see it? Where, how do we deploy it? You know, th this is a very nascent place. There are, there are no, uh, I, I don't think there is one right answer uh, what, what it's going to uh, be like and technology is evolving. But doing a fashion show with uh, realistic human-like um, avatars uh, with layers to showcase fashion collection is is one of the areas that we think is going to uh, evolve. The other areas where we see, um, um, you know, today practical implementation of the tech that can solve the problem of today in the market. Uh, and this is how we are looking into it. I, I, I can throw out there another example that we think is going to be very relevant um, and, and, and adopted by brands is uh, the tech tools that are going to address the issue of a secondary market. The aftermarket today uh, is $50 billion industry that grows faster than the luxury industry. So this is what uh, we call pre-owned market or circular fashion. It's basically items that you own and you, there are several, um, you know, big players in the world, like uh, Real Real, West Tech Collective. We at Farfetch in our group have uh, um, uh, aftermarket marketplace dedicated to uh, sneakers and street um, wear, which called called uh, Stadium Goods. And 
Today, we look into, in our vision, we look into brands like creators. So for us, brands are the creators. Yes, some of them are big corporations and big organizations. Nevertheless, they are the ones who created uh, the a product, they own the IP. And therefore, we think it's only fair when the, the item they created is changing hands in secondary market, there needs to be a royalty paid to the creator. Today, we have built that technology. We see it in, in NFTs. If you are the creator of NFT, it changes hands on OpenSea, uh, you get a royalty. In a similar way, we try to, you know, we are looking into ways to replicate that experience uh, for physical products. And, um, you know, as I said, we were looking into what exists in real life and trying to find the technology in Web3 that can address that issue today. The NFTs with underlying smart contracts on a blockchain provide a, a, a very stellar uh, opportunity to address these issues, to build into smart contracts, uh, a, a royalty that is linked to the uh, wallet of the, uh, the brand, the creator, that will um, make royalties out of um, what they deserve, that the product they created changes hands, they need to make royalties. So this is another area that we feel uh, the technology can address today. And Nike actually is a great example there. I think they've made more money in the secondary market. I'm pretty sure it's hundreds of millions of dollars in secondary royalties that dwarfed any of the primary sales of the original item, right? So this is not theory, it's already precedent. Um, and as you say, that being able to extend then to um, a physical version, either standalone physical item or digital, I hate that word, but you know, digital. Uh, digital uh, physical twin. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is interesting to also give the perspective to the audience. What are type of the things that we are looking into, and and and, and another probably call out to the our uh, accelerator in a partnership. Uh, some of the other areas we feel that the technology is there to help address uh, some of the existing pains in um, in, in the industry. Um, we are very thoroughly looking for um, solutions in uh, tokenized loyalty. So tokenized meta loyalty program that can create that required tokenomics to support redeemability in Web3, but also in Web2, in physical stores, but also on uh, .coms. Pan luxury tokenized loyalty program powered by utilities coming from uh, a universe of um, luxury brands. And these type of projects are possible through collaboration only. And this is why when we look into that, we don't look to replace Farfetch's loyalty program only, but we're looking into solutions that are, are sitting beyond, uh, beyond Farfetch. To throw uh, some other areas where we think it's very interesting and the industries will be adopting into that is that uh, digital to physical, the reverse of physical to, uh, sorry, uh, the, the physical to digital is what the phenomenon in, 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 in Web3 that we've been observing in, in, in past uh, probably 12 months is creation of IP. It has been absolutely phenomenal to see that the IP is created in Web3 through communities community-driven IPs that are, in the essence, are brands as such, is, is an IP, had outpaced in terms of desirability and adoptability 100-year-old brands that have been investing in that for, for, for many, many uh, uh, decades. And as I said, fashion and luxury are very community-driven and culture-making-driven uh, industries and building world-class high level luxury um, level uh, collaborations in physical world, leveraging Web3 IPs, I th we think is going to be uh, massive, it's going to be real and it's the need is there now. We have seen many communities experimenting with merch drops, dedicated merch drops and communities absolutely love that. And we think give it a, 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 a sort of a fresh uh, air, uh, you know, a breath of air through elevated luxury experiences, there can be uh, a brand creations, uh, a give birth to next generation of culturally relevant luxury brands. This, this is the area that we also look closely um, as well. 
As we mentioned at the top end, we've begun a collaboration around an accelerator, what we hope to be uh, many. Um, actually, by the time that this goes out, so, um, you know, it's kind of second week of October 2022, that cohort should hopefully be announced. We had record number of applications, um, a really high quality of, of, of startup looking to leverage both the kind of specialisms, Web3 specialisms at Outlier, but then also um, the kind of industry knowledge network and ability to just kind of fast track that, that go to market that Farfetch brings. So we're really excited um, to, to kind of, you know, see, see what we can do there. And I know there are a number of initiatives um, that you're not able to talk about at the moment, but that will be released over the coming months. So very excited to kind of watch watch that space. Maybe just finally, I think, you know, as you said, the kind of founder is hero at Farfetch, which is why it felt so natural to run, run an accelerator with you, because of course our, our business is backing founders as change agents, ultimately. Um, but also I think for people to understand the level of seriousness that Web3 occupies at Farfetch. Um, because as I understand it, the, the the senior management of the firm, it is a is a key OKR, right? That there is, I don't know specifically what it is, but Web3 is an OKR for senior management, some of the most senior management at Farfetch. That's correct. Uh, I think this is interesting. If you look into the Web3 business units, the forming initiatives in, in most of the companies, including our industry, sit with innovation team. It's something that the innovation team does, experiments, etc. Because we believe, uh, and it came from the innovation uh, team in, in terms of uh, sort of seeding it, bringing like surfacing towards the leadership attention. But because we, after our deep dives, we realized how serious, how inseparable part of the industry it is for us. We very quickly took it out of innovation and created dedicated business unit that transparently sits throughout all group business units. Web3 uh, became company level, not specifically my OKR uh, because I'm running it, but company level OKR to send the message and cascade down to message to 7,000 far fetchers that Web3 is not a one thing. It has touch points with marketing, with supply chain, with loyalty program, with brand platform, with stadium goods, you know, it's, it, it, it does really have touch points uh, everywhere. Our journey did start from educating our uh, own people, make them uh, buy in into obviously, you know, this is a process and we, we, you, you need to work um, on that. But I, I, I guess it's worth mentioning that the education of internal education, industry education, brand partner education is part of uh, part of the strategy. But as far as the org design is concerned, Web3 is not an innovation for us anymore. It is a table stakes and it is a standalone um, business unit that we will be investing more and more uh, going forward. Yeah, so, I mean, I think if people haven't already got the message now, I think what's really clear and exciting is not only a far-fetch creating the blueprint for how fashion luxury engages with Web3, but I actually also think a blueprint for how enterprise more generally um, can adopt um, the paradigm, both you know, socially, culturally, and technologically, um, because it's of course all, all three of those things and also an economic paradigm shift, right? So- Yeah, absolutely. Um, and look, it's, I think it's also worth mentioning and, and it, it, this is, um, uh, you know, nicely um, segueing to the accelerator is given, given the, the principles, the nature of the place we are, you know, we, we do have a, a call for collaboration. We're big believers that, you know, the, this needs to be an ecosystem play. Uh, it cannot be owned uh, by, if, even if you are leading category, you cannot own the, own the space. And if you look into some of the foundational work that we do, they're all through uh, collaboration with um, existing players. And we appreciate and acknowledge and appreciate that in order for this to grow and survive uh, and have billion users instead of one million users, you know, uh, 
uh, it needs to have an ecosystem approach. Other startups, creative minds, uh, young founders need to come and build their own startups, their own economies on top of uh, what we're launching. And we are here to collaborate. Hence, the accelerator uh, in partnership with uh, Outlier Venture, which we are very proud of. We already seen through the first cohort applications that we can immediately solve some of the areas that we're, we were trying to solve on our own and we were struggling. And then here we go, there is this startup from Latin America that solved it somehow. And now we're gonna take uh, them and, and, and do what uh, the World Accelerator says, help them accelerate. Um, so it's, it, 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 it is very exciting part uh, of our journey and we will going forward we will be collaborating uh, even more and hoping that the, the accelerator is going to be that sort of um, funnel for us to find uh, these great uh, startups yeah well look it goes without saying it's a, been a real pleasure collaborating with you even though we've just begun the journey um, I think that one thing uh, so as I said we, we kind of closed off now the first cohort but we're looking to do you know, many of these. So I would definitely um, encourage startups that are kind of relevant. And we do have a bit of a breakdown on the thesis. To, to, to reply even now, you can go to outlierventures.io slash Basecamp. You can find the Farfetch specific program and you can uh, still apply for future cohorts. It's never too early in your process. Um, we're pretty much always recruiting. We generally run these things back to back. Um, so we'd love to see you there. Um, Martin, it's a pleasure working with you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I know um, both people sat within enterprise, you know, thinking about how they can help their organization move forward, as well as um, aspiring founders are going to be um, very inspired by what you said today. Jamie, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure and uh, super excited about what's coming next.